Section zero of Prometheus Illbound. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prometheus Illbound by Andre Gide, translated by Lillian Rothmere. Section zero. Preface. The work of art is the exaggeration of an idea, says Gide in the epilogue of the Prometheus Illbound. This is really the explanation of the whole book, and of many other books of Gide. His world is a world of abstract ideas, under the action of which most of his characters move as marionettes. Time and space are the boards, which, with the help of our minds, have been set up by the innumerable truths of the universe as a stage for their own performances. And there we play our parts like determined, convinced, devoted and voluptuous marionettes. That is the reason why there is a determinist atmosphere in his books, and that even the disinterested act appears as the reaction of the mind on its own concept. Zeus, the banker, poses this disinterested act because his thought refuses or hesitates to admit it. The same thing happens with Lafcadio in the Cave du Vatican when he is on the point of murdering Amédée Fleurissoir. The tyranny of ideas is the dominating force of his characters. Even his first writings, where one finds some of his best pages, which appear to be purely lyrical explosion, such as Les Nourritures Terrestres and Le Voyage du Rien, are really the songs of a mind which leads its life by the concept of eternal desire and detachment, a mind very near that of Nietzsche. It is because of that tyranny of ideas that Gide is attracted by religious psychology. After all, Alissa of La Porte Trotte sacrifices her life and her happiness to her ideas. It is because of that also that one of the most daring books of the time, L'Immoraliste, is written in the most moral way. The feelings are only described by their reaction on the brain. And this applies to nearly the whole work of Gide. Even his concept of heroism is ruled by it. His heroes are monomaniacs of a thought which they believe or create ideal. His roi candole is a man stupefied by the idea of his possessions. That which does not nourish his brain is a reason for depression. And as love or passion absorbs the brain without nourishing it, he resents it. Every attempt of a purely amorous adventure is a failure, as well in L'Immoraliste as in the Tentative Amoureuse. On the contrary, when it becomes by struggle a problem for the brain, it excites him. Alissa was really his only love, and he could not love Isabelle when she had lost her power of attraction through the revelation of the unknown she represented to his mind. The exaltation of Gide is a Nietzschean exaltation. It is an exaltation caused by the power of mind. The definition of genius he gives in pretext is very characteristic from that point of view. He calls it le sentiment de la ressource. His sensitiveness is the sensitiveness of the brain, which is so acute that it vibrates through his whole personality. From there comes the clear, logical form of his tales. The book Prometheus Illbound, which we present to the English public today, is one of the most characteristic books of Gide, a work of pure intellectual fantasy where the subtle brain of the author has full play. It is the expression of the humorous side of a mind which must be ranked among the greatest of the world's literature. Lillian Rothermere. End of section zero. Section 1 of Prometheus Illbound. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Prometheus Illbound by Andre Gide. Translated by Lillian Rothmere. Eagle, Vulture, or Dove. Victor Hugo. In the month of May, 1890, at two o'clock in the afternoon, this occurred, which might appear strange. On the boulevard leading from the Madeleine to the Opera, a stout gentleman of middle age, with nothing remarkable about him but uncommon corpulence, was approached by a thin gentleman who, smilingly, thinking no harm, we believe, gave him back a handkerchief that he had just dropped. The corpulent gentleman thanked him briefly and was going his way when he suddenly leant towards the thin man and must have asked for information, which must have been given, for he produced from his pocket a portable ink-pot and pens, which without more ado he handed to the thin gentleman, and also an envelope which up to this minute he had been holding in his hand. 
and those who passed could see the thin man writing an address upon it but here begins the strange part of the story which no newspaper however reported the thin gentleman after having given back the pen and the envelope had not even the time to smile adieu when the fat gentleman in form of thanks abruptly struck him on the face then jumped into a cab and disappeared before any of the spectators stupefied with surprise i was there thought of stopping him i have been told since that it was zeus the banker the thin gentleman visibly upset by the attentions of the crowd insisted that he had hardly felt the blow notwithstanding that the blood poured out of his nose and his cut open lip he begged them to be kind enough to leave him alone and the crowd on his insistence slowly dispersed thus the reader will allow us to leave at present someone he will hear of sufficiently later on a chronicle of private morality one i will not speak of public morals for there are none but this reminds me of an anecdote when on the heights of the caucasus prometheus found that chains clamps straight waistcoats parapets and other scruples had on the whole a numbing effect on him for a change he turned to the left stretched his right arm and between the fourth and fifth hours of an autumn afternoon walked down the boulevard which leads from the madeleine to the opera different parisian celebrities passed continually before his eyes where are they going prometheus asked himself and settling himself in a cafe with a book he asked waiter where are they going the history of the waiter and the millionaire if his lordship could see them coming and going every day as i do said the waiter he would also ask where do they come from it must be the same place as they pass every day i say to myself since they always return they cannot have found what they want now i wait for his lordship to ask me what are they looking for and his lordship will see what i shall reply then prometheus asked what are they looking for the waiter replied since they do not remain where they go it cannot be happiness his lordship may believe me or not and coming nearer he said in a low voice they are looking for their personalities his lordship does not live here no said prometheus one can easily see that said the waiter yes personality we call it here idiosyncrasy like me for example from what you see you think i am just a waiter in a restaurant well your lordship no it is by choice you may believe me or not i have an inner life i observe personalities are the only interesting things and then the relations between personalities it is very well arranged in this restaurant tables for three i will explain the management later on you will dine soon will you not we will introduce you prometheus was a little tired the waiter continued yes tables for three that is what i found the easiest three gentlemen arrive they are introduced they are introduced if they wish it of course for in my restaurant before dining you must give your name then say what you do so much the worse if you deceive each other then you sit down not i you talk not i of course but i put you in sympathy i listen i scrutinize i direct the conversation at the end of dinner i know three inner men three personalities they know i you understand i listen i bring into relation they submit to the relationship you will ask me what do you gain by this oh nothing at all it pleases me to create relationships oh not for me it is what one would call an absolutely gratuitous act prometheus appeared a little tired the waiter continued a gratuitous act does this convey nothing to you to me it seems extraordinary i thought for a long time that this was the one thing that distinguished man from the animals a gratuitous act i called man an animal capable of a gratuitous act and then afterwards i thought the contrary that man is the only being incapable of acting gratuitously gratuitously just think without reason yes i hear shall we say without motive incapable then this idea began to fidget me i said to myself why does he do this why does he do that and yet i am not a determinist but that reminds me of an anecdote i have a friend my lord you will hardly believe me 
oh he is a millionaire he is also intelligent he said to himself a gratuitous act how to do it and understand this does not only mean an act that brings no return no but gratuitous an act that has no motive do you understand no interest no passion nothing the act disinterested born of itself the act without aim thus without master the free act the act autochthon hey said prometheus listen well said the waiter my friend went out one morning taking with him a banknote of twenty pounds in an envelope and a blow prepared in his hand the point was to find somebody without choosing him so he drops his handkerchief in the street and to the man who picks it up evidently kindly since he picked it up the millionaire pardon sir do you not know someone the other yes several the millionaire then sir will you have the kindness to write his name on this envelope here is a table pens and a pencil the other good-naturedly writes then now sir will you explain yourself the millionaire replies it is on principle then i forgot to tell you that he was very strong he strikes him with the blow he had in his hand then calls a cab and disappears do you understand two gratuitous acts in one go the banknote of twenty pounds sent to an address which he had not selected and the blow given to a person who selected himself to pick up the handkerchief no but is it gratuitous enough and the relation i bet you have not seriously scrutinized the relationship for as the act is gratuitous it is what we call here reversible one receives twenty pounds for a blow and the other a blow for twenty pounds then no one knows one is lost think of it a gratuitous act there is nothing more demoralizing but my lord is beginning to be hungry i beg his lordship's pardon i forget myself i talk too much will his lordship kindly give me his name so that i can introduce him prometheus said prometheus simply prometheus i was right his lordship is a stranger here and his lordship's occupation is i do nothing said prometheus oh no no said the waiter with an ingratiating smile only to see his lordship one knows at once that he is a man with an occupation it is so long ago stammered prometheus never mind never mind continued the waiter anyway his lordship need not be uneasy in introducing i only say the name if you like but the occupation never come tell me his lordship's occupation is making matches murmured prometheus blushing there followed a painful silence the waiter understanding that he should not have insisted prometheus feeling that he should not have answered in a consoling tone well after all his lordship does not make them any more said the waiter but then what i must write down something i cannot write simply prometheus his lordship has perhaps an avocation a speciality after all what can his lordship do nothing again said prometheus then let us say journalist now if his lordship will come into the restaurant i cannot serve dinner outside and he cried a table for three one by two doors two gentlemen entered they could be seen giving their names to the waiter but the introductions not having been asked for without more ado the men both sat down and when they had sat down two gentlemen said one of them if i have come to this restaurant where the food is bad it is only to talk i have a horror of solitary meals and this system of tables for three pleases me as with two one might wrangle but you look taciturn it is quite unintentional said prometheus shall i continue yes please do it seems to me quite possible that during lunch three people have time to become very well known to each other not losing too much time eating not talking too much and avoiding trite topics i mean to say mentioning only strictly individual experiences i do not pretend that one is obliged to talk but why come to this restaurant where the food is bad if conversation does not suit you prometheus was very tired the waiter leant over and whispered that is cocles the one who is going to speak is damocles damocles said 
the history of damocles sir if you had said that to me a month ago i should have had nothing to say but after what happened to me last month all my ideas have changed i will not speak of my old thoughts except to make you understand in what way i have changed now gentlemen since thirty days i feel that i am an original unique being with a very singular destiny so gentlemen you can deduct that before i felt the contrary i lived a perfectly ordinary life and made it my business to be as commonplace as possible now however i must admit that a commonplace man does not exist and i affirm that it is a vain ambition to try to resemble everybody for everybody is composed of each one and each one does not resemble anybody but never mind i took the greatest pains to put things right i drew up statistics i calculated the happy medium without understanding that extremes meet that he who goes to bed very late comes across him who gets up very early and that he who chooses the happy medium risks to fall between two stools every night i went to bed at ten i slept eight hours and a half i was most careful in all my actions to copy the majority and in all my thoughts the most approved opinions useless to insist but one day a personal adventure happened to me the importance of which in the life of a well-ordered man as i was can only be understood later on it is a precedent it is terrible and i received it three just imagine one morning i received a letter gentlemen i see by your lack of astonishment that i am telling my story very badly i should have told you first that i did not expect any letters i receive exactly two a year one from my landlord to ask for the rent and one from my bankers to inform me that i can pay it but on the first of january i received a third letter i cannot tell you where from the address was in an unknown hand the complete lack of character shown in the handwriting which was revealed to me by graphologists whom i consulted gave me no clue the only indication the writing gave was one of great kindness and here again certain of them inferred weakness they could make nothing of it the writing i speak you understand of the writing on the envelope for in the envelope there was none none not a word not a line in the envelope there was nothing but a banknote of twenty pounds i was just going to drink my chocolate but i was so astonished that i let it get cold i searched my mind nobody owes me money i have a fixed revenue gentlemen and with little economies each year notwithstanding the continual fall in the value of stock i managed to live within my income i expected nothing as i have said i have never asked for anything my usual regular life prevents me from even wishing for anything i gave much thought to the question after the best methods cour unde quo qua from where for where by where why and this note was not an answer for this was the first time in my life i questioned anything i thought it must be a mistake perhaps i can repair it this sum was intended no doubt for someone of the same name so i looked in the post office directory for a homonym who was perhaps expecting the letter but my name cannot be common as in looking through that enormous book i was the only one of that name indicated i hoped to come to a better result by the writing on the envelope and find out who sent the letter if not to whom it was sent it was then that i consulted the graphologists but nothing no nothing they could tell me nothing which only increased my distress these twenty pounds troubled me more and more every day i would like to get rid of them but i do not know what to do for anyhow or if someone had given them to me at least they deserve to be thanked i should like to show my gratitude but to whom always in the hope of something turning up i carry the note with me it does not leave me day or night i am at its disposal before i was banal but free now i belong to that note this adventure has decided me i was nothing now i am somebody since this adventure i am restless i search for people to talk to and if i come here for my meals it is because of this system of tables for three among the people i meet here i hope one day to find the one who will know the writing on the envelope here it is with these words damocles drew from his breast a sigh and from his frock coat a dirty yellow envelope his full name was written there in a very ordinary handwriting then a strange thing happened cocles who up to that time had been silent kept silent but suddenly raised his hand and made a violent effort to strike damocles 
the waiter catching his hand just in time. Cocles recovered himself and sadly made this speech, which can be only understood later on. After all, it is better so, for if I had succeeded in returning you the blow, you would have believed it your duty to give me back the note, and it does not belong to me. Then seeing that Damocles was waiting for a further explanation, it was I, he added, pointing to the envelope, who wrote your address. But how did you know my name? cried Damocles, rather annoyed by the incident. By chance, quietly said Cocles. In any case, that is of little importance in this story. My story is even more curious than yours. Let me tell you in a few words. The History of Cocles I have very few friends in the world, and before this happened I did not know of one. I do not know who was my father, and never knew my mother. For a long time I wondered why I lived. I went out into the streets, searching for a determining influence from outside. I thought, the first thing that happens to me will decide my destiny, for I did not make myself as I am, too naturally kind for that. The first act, I knew, would give a motive to my life. Naturally kind, as I have said, my first act was to pick up a handkerchief. The one who dropped it had only gone three steps. Running after him, I returned it to him. He took it without appearing surprised. No, the surprise was mine when he handed me an envelope. The same one you see here. Will you have the kindness, he said smilingly, to write here an address? What address, I asked. That, he replied, of anyone you know. So saying, he placed near me all the materials to write with. Wishing to let myself go to exterior influence, I submitted. But as I told you, I have few friends in the world. I wrote the first name that came into my head at the moment, a name quite unknown to me. Having written the name I bowed, would have walked on, when I received a tremendous blow on my face. In my astonishment I lost sight of my adversary. When I came to myself I was surrounded by a crowd. All spoke at once. They would not let me alone. I could only rid myself of their attentions by assuring them that I was not hurt at all, even though my jaw caused me terrible pain and my nose was bleeding furiously. The tumefaction of my face confined me to my room for a week. I passed my time thinking, why did he strike me? It must have been a mistake. What could he have against me? I have never hurt anybody. Nobody could wish me ill. There must be a reason for ill will. And if it was not a mistake? For the first time I was thinking. If that blow was intended for me? In any case, what does it matter? By mistake or not, I received it, and shall I return it? I have told you I am naturally good-hearted. And then there is another thing which worries me. The man who struck me was much stronger than I. When my face was well and I could go out again, I looked everywhere for my adversary. Yes, but it was to avoid him. Anyway, I never saw him again, and if I avoided him it was without knowing it. But, and in saying this he leant towards Prometheus, you see today how everything joins up. It is becoming more complicated instead of less so. I understand that, thanks to my blow, this gentleman has received twenty pounds. Ah, but allow me, said Damocles. I am Cocles, sir, said he, bowing to Damocles. Cocles! And I tell you my name, Damocles, for you must certainly be pleased to know to whom you owe your windfall. But, yes, I know. We will not say to whom. We will say, from the suffering of whom. For understand and do not forget that your gain came from my misfortune. But... Do not cavil, I beg you. Between your gain and my trouble there is a relation. I do not quite know which, but there is a relation. But, sir, do not call me sir. But, my dear Cocles, say simply Cocles. But once again, my best Cocles, no, sir, no, Damocles. And it is no use your talking, for I still wear the mark of the blow on my cheek. It is a wound that I will show you at once. The conversation becoming disagreeably personal, the waiter at this moment showed his tact. 4. By a clever movement, simply upsetting a full plate over Prometheus, he suddenly diverted the attention of the other two. Prometheus could not restrain an exclamation, and his voice after the others seemed so profound that one realized that up to this minute he had not spoken. The irritation of Damocles and Cocles joined forces. But you say nothing, they cried. Prometheus speaks. 
oh gentlemen anything that i can say has so little importance i do not really see how and then the more i think no truly i have nothing to say you have each of you a history i have none excuse me believe me it is with the greatest interest that i have heard you each relate an adventure which i wish i could but i cannot even express myself easily no truly you must excuse me gentlemen i have been in paris less than two hours nothing has as yet happened to me except my delightful meeting with you which gives me such a good idea of what a conversation can be between two parisians when they are both men of talent but before you came here said cocles you must have been somewhere added damocles yes i admit it said prometheus but again once more it has absolutely no connection never mind said cocles we came here to talk we have both of us damocles and i already given our share you alone bring nothing you listen it is not fair it is time to speak mr the waiter feeling instinctively that the moment had come for the introduction quietly slipped in the name to complete the sentence prometheus he said simply prometheus repeated damocles excuse me sir but it seems to me that that name already oh interrupted prometheus quickly that is not of the slightest importance but if there is nothing of importance impatiently cried the other two why have you come here dear mr mr prometheus replied prometheus simply dear mr prometheus as i remarked a while ago continued cocles this restaurant invites conversation and nothing will convince me that your strange name is the only thing that distinguishes you if you have done nothing you are surely going to do something what are you capable of doing what is the most distinguishing thing about you what have you that nobody else possesses why do you call yourself prometheus drowned beneath this flow of questions prometheus bent his head and slowly and in a serious voice stammered what have i gentlemen what have i oh i have an eagle a what eagle vulture perhaps opinions differ an eagle that's funny an eagle where is he you insist on seeing it said prometheus yes they cried if it is not too indiscreet then prometheus quite forgetting where he was suddenly started up and gave a great cry a call to his eagle and this stupefying thing happened history of the eagle a bird which from afar looked enormous but which seen close was not so very big after all darkened for a moment the sky above the boulevard and sped like a whirlwind towards the cafe bursting through the window it put out cocley's eye with one stroke of its wing and then chirruping as it did so tenderly indeed but imperiously fell with a swoop upon prometheus's right side and prometheus forthwith undid his waistcoat and offered his liver to the bird five there was a great disturbance voices now mingled confusedly for some other people had come into the restaurant but for goodness sake take care cried cocles his remark was unheard beneath the loud cries of that an eagle i don't think look at that poor gaunt bird that an eagle not much at the most a conscience the fact is that the great eagle was pitiful to see thin and mangy and with drooping wings as it greedily devoured its miserable pittance the poor bird seemed as if it had not eaten for three days others nevertheless made a fuss and whispered insinuatingly to prometheus but sir i hope you do not think that this eagle distinguishes you in any way an eagle shall i tell you an eagle we all have one but said another but we do not bring them to paris continued another in paris it is not the fashion eagles are a nuisance you see what it has already done if it amuses you to let it eat your liver you are at liberty to do so but i must tell you that it is a painful sight when you do it you should hide yourself prometheus confused murmured excuse me gentlemen oh i am really sorry what can i do you ought to get rid of it before you come in sir and some said smother it and others sell it the newspaper officers are there for nothing else sir and in the tumult which followed no one noticed damocles who suddenly asked the waiter for the bill the waiter gave him the following three lunches with conversation thirty francs shop window four hundred and fifty francs a glass eye for cocles three francs fifty 
and keep the rest for yourself said damocles handing the banknote to the waiter then he quickly made off beaming with joy the end of this chapter is much less interesting little by little the restaurant became empty in vain prometheus and cocles insisted on paying their share of the bill damocles had already paid it prometheus said good-bye to the waiter and cocles and going back slowly to the caucasus he thought sell it smother it tame it perhaps end of section one section two of prometheus ill bound this librivox recording is in the public domain prometheus ill bound by andre gide translated by lillian rothermere the imprisonment of prometheus one it was a few days after this that prometheus denounced by the overzealous waiter found himself in prison for making matches without a license the prison was isolated from the rest of the world and its only outlook was onto the sky from the outside it had the appearance of a tower in the inside prometheus was consumed by boredom the waiter paid him a visit oh said prometheus smiling i am so happy to see you i was bored to death tell me you who come from outside the wall of this dungeon separates me from everything and i know nothing about other people what is happening and you first tell me what you are doing since your scandal replied the waiter nothing much hardly anybody has been to the restaurant we have lost a great deal of time in repairing the window i am greatly distressed said prometheus but damocles have you seen damocles he left the restaurant so quickly the other day i was not able to say good-bye i am so sorry he seemed a very quiet person well-mannered and full of scruples i was touched when he told me so naturally of his trouble i hope when he left the table he was happier that did not last said the waiter i saw him the next day more uneasy than ever in talking to me he cried his greatest anxiety was the health of cocles is he unwell asked prometheus cocles oh no replied the waiter i will say more he sees better since he sees with only one eye he shows every one his glass eye and is delighted when he is condoled with when you see him tell him that his new eye looks well and that he wears it gracefully but add how he must have suffered he suffers then yes perhaps when people do not sympathize with him but then if cocles is well and does not suffer why is damocles anxious because of that which cocles could have suffered you advise me then strongly to say it yes but damocles thinks it and that's what kills him what else does he do nothing this unique occupation wears him out between us he is a man obsessed he says that without those twenty pounds cocles would not be miserable and cocles he says the same but he has become rich really how oh i do not know exactly but he has been talked about in the papers and a subscription has been opened in his favour and what does he do with it he is an artful fellow with the money collected he thinks of founding a hospital a hospital yes a small hospital for the one-eyed he has made himself director of it ah bah cried prometheus you interest me enormously i hoped you would be interested said the waiter and tell me the millionaire oh he he is a wonderful chap if you imagine that all that upsets him he is like me he observes if it would amuse you i will introduce you to him when you come out of this well by the way why am i here prometheus said at last what am i accused of do you know waiter you seem to know everything my goodness no pretended the waiter all that i know is that it is only preliminary detention after they have condemned you you will know well so much the better said prometheus i always prefer to know good-bye said the waiter it is late with you it is astonishing how the time flies but tell me your eagle what has become of him bless me i have thought no more of him said prometheus but when the waiter had gone prometheus began to think of his eagle he must increase but i must decrease and as prometheus was bored in the evening he called his eagle the eagle came i have waited a long time for thee said prometheus 
why didst thou not call me before replied the eagle for the first time prometheus looked at his eagle casually perched upon the twisted bars of the dungeon in the golden light of the sunset he appeared more spiritless than ever he was grey ugly stunted surly resigned and miserable he seemed too feeble to fly seeing which prometheus cried with pity faithful bird he said to him dost thou suffer tell me what is the matter i am hungry said the eagle eat said prometheus uncovering his liver the bird ate i suffer said prometheus but the eagle said nothing more that day two the next day at sunrise prometheus longed for his eagle he called it from the depth of the reddening dawn and as the sun rose the eagle appeared he had three more feathers and prometheus sobbed with tenderness how late thou comest he said caressing his feathers it is because i cannot yet fly very fast said the bird i skim the ground why i am so weak what dost thou want to make thee fly faster thy liver very well eat the next day the eagle had eight more feathers and a few days after he arrived before the dawn prometheus himself became very thin tell me of the world he said to the eagle what has happened to all the others oh now i fly very high replied the eagle i see nothing but the sky and thee his wings had grown slowly bigger lovely bird what hast thou to tell me this morning i have carried my hunger through the air eagle wilt thou never be less cruel no but i may become very beautiful prometheus enamoured of the future beauty of his eagle gave him each day more to eat one evening the eagle did not leave him the next day it was the same he fascinated the prisoner by his gnawings and the prisoner who fascinated him by his caresses languished and pined away for love all day caressing his feathers sleeping at night beneath his wings and feeding him as he desired the eagle did not stir night or day sweet eagle who would have believed it believed what that our love could be so charming ah prometheus tell me my sweet bird why am i shut up here what does that matter to thee am i not with thee yes it matters little but art thou pleased with me beautiful eagle yes if thou thinkest i am beautiful three it was springtime around the bars of the tower the fragrant wisteria was in flower one day we will go away said the eagle really cried prometheus because i am now very strong and thou art thinner i can carry thee eagle my eagle take me away and the eagle carried him away a chapter while waiting the next one that evening cocles and damocles met each other they chatted together but with a certain embarrassment what can you expect said cocles our points of view are so opposed do you think so replied damocles my only desire is that we understand each other you say that but you only understand yourself and you you do not even listen to what i say i know all that you would say say it then if you know it you pretend to know it better than i do alas cocles you get cross but for the love of god tell me what i ought to do ah nothing more for me i beg you you have already given me a glass eye glass in lack of a better my cocles yes after having half blinded me but it was not i dear cocles it was more or less and in any case you can pay for the eye thanks to my blow cocles forget the past no doubt it pleases you to forget that's not what i mean to say to you but what do you mean to say then go on speak you do not listen to me because i know all that you would say the discussion for want of something new began to take a dangerous turn when both men were suddenly arrested by an advertisement which ran as follows this evening at eight o'clock in the hall of the new moons prometheus delivered will speak of his eagle at eight thirty the eagle will be presented and will perform some tricks at nine o'clock a collection will be made by the waiter on behalf of cockley's hospital i must see that said cockley's i will go with you said damocles 
4. In the hall of the new moons, at eight o'clock precisely, the crowd gathered. Cocles sat on the left, Damocles on the right, and the rest of the public in the middle. A thunder of applause greeted the entry of Prometheus. He mounted the steps of the platform, placed his eagle at the side of him, and pulled himself together. In the hall there was a palpitating silence. The Petitio Principii. Gentlemen, began Prometheus, I do not pretend, alas, to interest you by what I am about to say, so I was careful to bring this eagle with me. After each tiresome part of my lecture, he will play some tricks. I have also with me some indecent photographs and some fireworks, with which when I reach the most serious moments of my lecture, I will try to distract the attention of the public. Thus I dare to hope, gentlemen, for some attention. At each new head of my discourse I shall have the honour, gentlemen, to ask you to watch the eagle eating his dinner. For, gentlemen, my discourse has three heads. I did not think it proper to reject this form, which is agreeable to my classical mind. This being the exordium, I will tell you at once, and without more ado, the first two heads of the discourse. First head. One must have an eagle. Second head. In any case, we all have one. Fearing that you will accuse me of prejudice, gentlemen, fearing also to interfere with my liberty of thought, I have prepared my lecture only up to that point. The third head will naturally unfold from the other two. I will let inspiration have all its own way. As conclusion, the eagle, gentlemen, will make the collection. Bravo, bravo, cried Cocles. Prometheus drank a little water. The eagle pirouetted three times round Prometheus and then bowed. Prometheus looked round the hall, smiled at Damocles and at Cocles, and as no sign of restlessness was as yet shown, he kept the fireworks for later on and continued. 5. However clever a rhetorician I may be, gentlemen, in the presence of such perspicacious minds as yours, I cannot juggle away the inevitable petitio principii, which awaits me at the beginning of this lecture. Gentlemen, try as we may, we cannot escape the petitio principii. Now, what is a petition of principles? Gentlemen, I dare to say it. Every petitio principii is an affirmation of temperament. For where principles are missing, there the temperament is affirmed. When I declare, you must have an eagle, you may all exclaim, Why? Now, what answer can I make in reply that will not bring us back to that formula, which is the affirmation of my temperament? I do not love men. I love that which devours them. Temperament, gentlemen, is that which must affirm itself. A fresh petitio principii, you will say. But I have demonstrated that every petitio principii is an affirmation of temperament. And as I say, one must affirm one's temperament, for it is important, I repeat. I do not love men. I love that which devours them. Now what devours man? His eagle. Therefore, gentlemen, one must have an eagle. I think I have fully demonstrated this. Alas, I see, gentlemen, that I bore you. Some of you are yawning. I could, it is true, here make a few jokes, but you would feel them out of place. I have an irredeemably serious mind. I prefer to circulate among you some indecent photographs. They will keep those quiet who are feeling bored, which will enable me to go on. Prometheus drank a drop of water. The eagle pirouetted three times round Prometheus and bowed. Prometheus went on. Continuation of Prometheus's lecture. Gentlemen, I have not always known my eagle. That is what makes me deduce, by a process of reasoning which the logic books I never studied till a week ago call by some particular name I have forgotten. That is what makes me deduce, I say, that even though the only eagle here is mine, you all, gentlemen, have an eagle. I have said nothing up to the present of my own history. Firstly because, up to the present, I have not understood it. And if I decide to speak of it now, it is because, thanks to my eagle, it now appears to me marvellous. 6. Gentlemen, as I have already said, my eagle was not always with me. Before his time, I was unconscious and beautiful, happy and naked and unaware. Oh, charming days! On the many fountained sides of the Caucasus, lascivious Asia, naked too and unaware, held me in her arms. Together we sported, tumbling in the valleys. The air sang, the water laughed. The simplest flowers were fragrant for our delight. And often we lay beneath spreading branches, 
among flowers which were the haunt of murmuring bees asia wedded me all laughter and then the murmuring swarms and the rustling leaves with which was mingled the music of the streams gently lulled us to the sweetest of slumbers around us all consented all protected our inhuman solitude suddenly one day asia said to me you should interest yourself in men i first had to find them i was willing enough to interest myself in them but it was to pity them they lived in such darkness i invented for them certain kinds of fire and from that moment my eagle began and it is since that day that i have become aware that i am naked at these words applause arose from various parts of the hall all of a sudden prometheus broke into sobs the eagle flapped his wings and cooed with an agonizing gesture prometheus opened his waistcoat and offered his tortured liver to the bird the applause redoubled then the eagle pirouetted three times round prometheus who drank a few drops of water and continued his lecture in these words seven gentlemen my modesty overcame me excuse me it is the first time i speak in public but now it is my sincerity which overcomes me gentlemen i have been more interested in men than i have ever admitted gentlemen i have done a great deal for men gentlemen i have passionately wildly and deplorably loved men and i have done so much for them one can almost say that i have made them for before what were they they existed but had no consciousness of existence i made this consciousness like a fire to enlighten them gentlemen i made it with all the love i bore them the first consciousness they had was that of their beauty it is this which caused the propagation of the race men were prolonged in their posterity the beauty of the first was repeated equally indifferently uneventfully it could have lasted a long time then i grew anxious for i carried in me already without knowing it my eagle's egg and i wanted more or better this propagation this piecemeal prolongation seemed to me to indicate in them an expectancy when in reality only my eagle was waiting i did not know that expectancy i thought was in man that expectancy i put in man besides having made man in my image i now understood that in every man there was something hatching in each one was the eagle's egg and then i do not know i cannot explain this all that i know is that not satisfied with giving them consciousness of existence i also wished to give them a reason for existence so i gave them fire flame and all the arts which a flame nourishes by warming their minds i brought forth the devouring faith in progress and i was strangely happy when their health was consumed in producing it no more belief in good but the morbid hope for better the belief in progress gentlemen that was their eagle our eagle is our reason for existence gentlemen man's happiness grew less and less but that was nothing to me the eagle was born gentlemen i loved men no more i loved what fed on them i had had enough of a humanity without history the history of man is the history of their eagles gentlemen eight applause broke out here and there prometheus abashed excused himself gentlemen i was lying pardon me it did not happen quite so quickly no i have not always loved eagles for a long time i preferred men their injured happiness was dear to me because once having interfered i believed myself responsible and in the evening every time i thought of it my eagle sad as remorse came to eat he was at this time gaunt and gray careworn and morose and he was as ugly as a vulture gentlemen look at him now and understand why i tell you this why i asked you to come here why i entreat you to listen to me it is because i have discovered this the eagle can become very beautiful now every one of us has an eagle as i have just most earnestly asserted an eagle alas a vulture perhaps no no not a vulture gentlemen gentlemen you must have an eagle and now i touch the most serious question why an eagle ah why let him say why here is mine gentlemen i bring him to you eagle will you reply now anxiously prometheus turned towards his eagle the eagle was motionless and remained silent prometheus continued in a distressed voice gentlemen gentlemen i have vainly questioned my eagle 
eagle speak now everyone listens to you who sends you why have you chosen me where do you come from where do you go to speak what is your nature the eagle remained silent no nothing not a word not a cry i hoped he would speak to you at any rate that is why i brought him with me must i speak alone here all is silence all is silence what does it mean i have questioned in vain then turning towards the audience oh i hoped gentlemen that you would love my eagle that your love would affirm his beauty that is why i gave myself up to him that is why i filled him with the blood of my soul but i see i am alone in admiring him is it not enough for you that he is beautiful or do you not admit his beauty look at him at least i have lived only for him and now i bring him to you there he is as for me i live for him but he but he why does he live eagle that i have nourished with the blood of my soul whom with all my love i have caressed here prometheus was interrupted by sobs must i then leave the earth without knowing why i loved you nor what you will do nor what you will be after me on the earth on the earth i have asked in vain in vain the words choked in his throat his voice could not be heard through his tears pardon me gentlemen he continued a little calmer pardon me for saying such serious things but if i knew more serious ones i would say them perspiring prometheus wiped his face drank some water and added the end of prometheus's lecture i have only prepared my lecture up to this point at these words there was a rustling among the audience several feeling bored wished to go out gentlemen cried prometheus i beseech you to stay it will not be very long now but the most important thing of all remains to be said if i have not already persuaded you gentlemen for goodness sake here quickly a few fireworks i will keep the best for the end gentlemen sit down again i pray you look do not think i want to economize i light six at a time but first waiter shut the doors the fireworks were more or less effective nearly every one sat down again but where was i cried prometheus i counted upon getting under way disturbance has checked me so much the better cried someone ah i know continued prometheus i wished to tell you again enough enough cried voices from all parts of the hall that you must love your eagle several cried why ironically i hear gentlemen someone asks me why i reply because then he will become beautiful but if we become ugly gentlemen i do not speak here words of self-interest one can see that they are words of self-devotion gentlemen one must devote oneself to one's eagle agitation many get up gentlemen do not move i will be personal it is not necessary to remind you of the history of cocles and damocles all here know it well well i will tell them to their faces the secret of their lives is in their self-devotion to their debt you cocles to your blow you damocles to your banknote cocles your duty was to make your scar deeper and your empty orbit emptier oh cocles yours damocles to keep your banknote to continue owing it owing it without shame owing even more owing it with joy there is your eagle there are other and more glorious ones but i tell you this the eagle will devour us anyway vice or virtue duty or passion cease to be commonplace and you cannot escape it but here the voice of prometheus was barely heard in the tumult but if you do not feed your eagle lovingly he will remain grey and miserable invisible to all and sly then you will call him conscience not worthy of the torments he causes without beauty gentlemen you must love your eagle love him to make him beautiful for it is for his future beauty that you must love your eagle now i have finished gentlemen my eagle will make the collection gentlemen you must love my eagle in the meantime i will let off some fireworks thanks to the pyrotechnic diversion the assembly dispersed without too much trouble but damocles took cold on coming out of the hall end of section two section three of prometheus ill bound this librivox recording is in the public domain prometheus ill bound by andre gide translated by lillian rothmere 
the illness of damocles one you know that he is not at all well said the waiter seeing prometheus a few days later who damocles oh very bad it was coming out after your lecture that he was taken ill but what is the matter the doctors hesitate it is a very unusual illness a shrinkage of the spine the spine yes the spine at least unless a miracle happens he must get worse he is very low i assure you and you should go and see him you go very often yourself i yes every day he is very anxious about cockley's i bring him news every day why doesn't cockley's go to see him himself cockley's he is too busy don't you remember your lecture it has made an extraordinary effect on him he talks of nothing but self-devotion and passes all his time looking in the streets for another blow which may benefit some unknown damocles in vain he offers his other cheek why not tell a millionaire i give him news every day that is really the reason why i visit damocles every day why does he not go and see damocles himself that is what i tell him but he refuses he does not wish to be known and yet damocles would certainly get well immediately if he knew his benefactor i tell him all this but he insists upon keeping his incognito and i understand now that it is not damocles but his illness which interests him you spoke of introducing me yes at once if you like they went off immediately two not knowing him ourselves we have decided not to say very much about the waiter's friend zeus but just to report these few remarks interview of the millionaire the waiter is it not true that you are very rich the millionaire half turning towards prometheus i am richer than you can ever imagine you belong to me he belongs to me everything belongs to me you think i am a banker i am really something quite different my effect on paris is hidden but it is none the less important it is hidden because it is not continuous yes i have above all the spirit of initiative i launch then once the affair is set going i leave it i have nothing more to do with it the waiter isn't it true that your actions are gratuitous the millionaire it is only i only a person whose fortune is infinite who can act with absolute disinterestedness for man it is impossible from that comes my love of gambling i do not gamble for gain you understand i gamble for the pleasure of gambling what could i gain that i do not possess already even time do you know my age prometheus and the waiter you appear still young sir the millionaire well do not interrupt me prometheus yes i have a passion for gambling my game is to lend to men i lend but it is not for pleasure i lend but it is sinking the capital i lend but with an air of giving i do not wish it known that i lend i play but i hide my game i experiment i play as a dutchman sows his seed as he plants a secret bulb that which i lend to men that which i plant in man i amuse myself by watching it grow without that man would be so empty let me tell you my most recent experience you will help me to analyze it just listen you will understand later i went down into the street with the idea of making someone suffer for a gift i would make to another to make one happy by the suffering of the other a blow and a note of twenty pounds was all that was necessary to one the blow and to the other the note is it clear what is less clear is the way of giving them i know it already interrupted prometheus oh really you know of it said zeus i have met both damocles and cockles it is precisely about them that i have come to speak to you damocles looks and calls for you he is very anxious he is ill for goodness sake go and see him sir stop said zeus i have no need of advice from anybody what did i tell you said the waiter prometheus was going away but suddenly turned again sir pardon me excuse an indiscreet question oh show it to me i beg you i should love so much to see it what your eagle but i have no eagle sir no eagle he has no eagle but not so much of one as i can hold in the hollow of my hand eagles and he laughed eagles 
It is I who give them. Prometheus was stupefied. Do you know what people say? The waiter asked the banker. What do they say? That you are God. I let them say so, said he. 3. Prometheus went to see Damocles, and then he went very often. He did not talk to him every time, but in any case the waiter gave him the news. One day he brought Cocles with him. The waiter received them. Well, how is he? asked Prometheus. Bad, very bad, replied the waiter. For three days the miserable man has not been able to take any food. His banknote torments him. He looks for it everywhere. He thinks he may have eaten it. He takes a purgative and thinks to find it in his stool. When his reason returns and he remembers his adventure, he is again in despair. He has a grudge against you, Cocles, because he thinks you have so complicated his debt that he no longer knows where he is. Most of the time he is delirious. At night there are three of us to watch him, but he keeps leaping upon his bed, which prevents us sleeping. Can we see him? said Cocles. Yes, but you will find him changed. He is devoured by anxiety. He has become thin, thin, thin. Will you recognize him? And will he recognize you? They entered on the tips of their toes. The Last Days of Damocles Damocles' bedroom smelt horribly of medicines. Low and very narrow, it was lighted gloomily by two nightlights. In an alcove, covered with innumerable blankets, one could see Damocles tossing about. He spoke all the time, although there was no one near him. His voice was hoarse and thick. Full of horror, Prometheus and Cocles looked at each other. He did not hear them approach and continued his moaning as if he were alone. And from that day, he was saying, it seemed to me both that my life began to have another meaning and that I could no longer live. That hated banknote, I believed I owed it to everyone, and I dared not give it to anyone, without depriving all the others. I only dreamed of getting rid of it. But how? The savings bank. But this increased my trouble. My debt was augmented by the interest on the money. And on the other hand, the idea of letting it stagnate was intolerable to me. So I thought it best to circulate the sum. I carried it always upon me. Regularly every week I changed the note into silver, and then the silver into another note. Nothing is lost or gained in this exchange. It is circular insanity. And to this was added another torture, that it was through a blow given to another that I received this note. One day, you know well, I met you in a restaurant. He is speaking of you, said the waiter. The eagle of Prometheus broke the window of the restaurant and put out Cockley's eye. Saved! Gratuitously, fortuitously, providentially, I will slip my banknote into the interstices of these events. No more debt. Saved! Ah, gentlemen, what an error! It was from that day that I became a dying man. How can I explain this to you? Will you ever understand my anguish? I am still in debt for this note, and now it is no longer in my possession. I tried like a coward to get rid of my debt, but I have not acquitted it. In my nightmares I awake covered with perspiration. Kneeling down I cry aloud, Lord, Lord, to whom do I owe this? I know nothing of it, but I owe. Owing is like duty. Duty, gentlemen, is a horrible thing. Look at me, I am dying of it. And now I am more tormented than ever because I have passed this debt on to you, Cocles. Cocles, it does not belong to you, that I, as the money it was bought with did not belong to me. And what hast thou that thou didst not receive, says the Bible? Received from whom? 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 My distress is intolerable. The wretched man spoke in short, sharp jerks. His voice grew inarticulate, choked as it was by gasps, sobs, and tears. Anxiously, Prometheus and Cocles listened. They took each other's hand and trembled. Damocles said, seeming to see them, Debt is a terrible duty, gentlemen. But how much more terrible is the remorse of having wished to evade a duty, as if the debt would cease to exist because it was transferred to another. But your eye burns you, Cocles. Cocles! I am certain it burns you, your glass eye. Tear it out. If it does not burn you, it ought to burn you, for it is not yours your eye, and if it is not yours, it must be your brother's. Whose is it? Whose? Whose? 
miserable man wept he became delirious and lost strength now and again fixing his eyes on prometheus and cocles he seemed to recognize them crying but understand me for pity's sake the pity i claim from you is not simply a compress on my forehead a bowl of fresh water a soothing drink it is to understand me help me to understand myself for pity's sake this which has come to me from i know not where to whom do i owe it to whom to whom and in order to cease one day from owing it one day believing i made with this a present to others to others to cocles the gift of an eye but it is not yours that eye cocles cocles give it back give it back but to whom to whom to whom not wishing to hear more cocles and prometheus went away four there you see said cocles coming down the stairs the fate of a man who has grown rich by another's suffering but is it true that you suffer asked prometheus from my eye occasionally said cocles but from the blow no more i prefer to have received it it does not burn any more it has revealed to me my goodness i am flattered by it i am pleased about it i never ceased to think that my pain was useful to my neighbor and that it brought him twenty pounds but the neighbor is dying of it cocles said prometheus did you not tell him that one must nourish one's eagle what do you expect damocles and i never could understand each other our points of view are entirely opposed prometheus said good-bye to cocles and ran to the house of zeus the banker for goodness sake show yourself he said or at least make yourself known the miserable man is dying i could understand your killing him since that is your pleasure but let him know at least who it is that is killing him that he may be at peace the millionaire replied i do not wish to lose my prestige five the end of damocles was admirable he pronounced a little while before his last hour some words which drew tears from the most unbelieving and made pious people say how edifying the most notable sentiment was the one expressed so well in these words i hope at any rate that he will not have felt the loss of it who asked someone he said damocles dying he who gave me something no it was providence cleverly replied the waiter damocles died after hearing these comforting words the funeral oh said prometheus to cocles leaving the chamber of death all that is horrible the death of damocles upsets me is it true that my lecture can have been the cause of his illness i cannot say said the waiter but i know that at any rate he was greatly moved by all that you said of your eagle of our eagle replied cocles i was so convinced said prometheus that is why you convinced him your words were very strong i thought that no one paid any attention and i insisted if i had known that he would listen so attentively what would you have said the same thing stammered prometheus then but i would not say the same thing now are you no longer convinced damocles was too much so i have other ideas about my eagle by the way where is he do not fear cocles i have my eye on him good-bye i shall wear mourning said cocles when shall we see each other again but at the funeral i suppose i will make a speech there i ought to repair in some way the damage i have done and afterwards i invite you to the funeral feast in the restaurant exactly where we saw damocles for the first time six at the funeral there were not many people damocles was very little known his death passed unnoticed except for those few interested in his history prometheus the waiter and cocles found themselves at the cemetery also a few idle listeners of the lecture everyone looked at prometheus as they knew he was to speak and they said what will he say for they remembered what he had said before before prometheus began to speak great astonishment was caused by the fact that he was unrecognizable he was fat fresh smiling smiling so much that his conduct was judged a little indecent as smiling still he advanced to the edge of the grave turned his back on it and spoke these simple words the history of titurus 
Gentlemen who are kind enough to listen to me, the words of scripture which serve as text for my brief discourse today are these. Let the dead bury their dead. We will therefore occupy ourselves no more with Damocles. The last time that I saw you all together was to hear me speak of my eagle. Damocles died of it. Leave the dead. It is nevertheless because of him, or rather thanks to his death, that now I have killed my eagle. Killed his eagle, cried everyone. That reminds me of an anecdote. Let us grant I have said nothing. 1. In the beginning was Titurus, and Titurus being alone and completely surrounded by swamps was bored. Then Menalcas passed by, who put an idea into the head of Titurus, a seed in the swamp before him. And this idea was the seed, and this seed was the idea. And with the help of God the seed germinated and became a little plant, and Titurus in the evening and in the morning knelt before it, thanking God for having given it to him. And the plant became tall and great, and as it had powerful roots it very soon completely dried up the soil around it. And thus Titurus had at last firm earth on which to set his feet, rest his head, and strengthen the works of his hands. When this plant had grown to the height of Titurus, Titurus tasted the joy of sleeping stretched under its shadow. Now this tree, being an oak tree, grew enormously, so much so that soon Titurus's hands were no longer sufficient to till and hoe the earth around the oak, to water the oak, to prune, to trim, to decorticate, to destroy the caterpillars, and to ensure in due season the picking of its many and diverse fruits. He engaged, therefore, a tiller and a hoer, and a trimmer and a decorticator, and a man to destroy the caterpillars, and a man to water the oak, and two or three fruit boys. And as each had to keep strictly to his own speciality, there was a chance of each person's work being well done. In order to arrange for the paying of the wages, Titurus had to have an accountant, who soon shared with a cashier the worries of Titurus's fortune. This grew like the oak. Certain arguments arising between the trimmer and the pruner and the depilator, as to where each man's work began and finished, Titurus saw the necessity of an arbitrator, who called for two lawyers to expose both sides of the question. Titurus took a secretary to record their judgments, and as they were only recorded for future reference, there had to be a keeper of the rolls. On the soil, meanwhile, houses appeared one by one, and it was necessary to have police for the streets, to guard against excesses. Titurus, overcome by work, began to feel ill. He sent for a doctor who told him to take a wife, and finding the work too much for him, Titurus was forced to choose a sheriff, and he himself was therefore appointed mayor. From this time he had only very few hours of leisure, when he could fish with a line from the windows of his house, which still continued to open on the swamp. Then Titurus instituted bank holidays, so that his people might enjoy themselves. But as this was expensive and no one was very rich, Titurus, in order to be able to lend them all money, first began by raising it from each of them separately. Now, the oak in the middle of the plain, for in spite of the town, in spite of the effort of so many men, it had never ceased to be the plain. The oak, as I said, in the middle of the plain, had no difficulty in being placed so that one of its sides was in shadow and the other in the sunshine. Under the oak, then, on the shady side, Titurus rendered justice. On the sunny side, he fulfilled his natural necessities. And Titurus was happy, for he felt his life was useful to others and fully occupied. 2. Man's effort can be intensified. Titurus's activity seemed to grow with encouragement. His natural ingenuity caused him to think of other means of employment. He set to work to furnish and decorate his house. The suitable character of the hangings and the convenience of each object were much admired. Industrious, he excelled in empiricism. He even made a little hook to hang his sponges on the wall, which after four days he found perfectly useless. Then Titurus built another room by the side of his room, where he could arrange the affairs of the nation. The two rooms had the same entrance to indicate that their interests were the same. But because of the one entrance which supplied both rooms with air, the two chimneys would not draw at the same time, so that when it was cold and a fire was lighted in one, the other was full of smoke. The days, therefore, that he wished for a fire, Titurus was forced to open his window. As Titurus protected everything and worked for the propagation of the species, a time came when the slugs crawled on his garden paths in such abundance that he did not know where to step for fear of crushing them and finally resigned. He invited a woman with a circulating library to come to the town, 
with whom he opened a subscription and as she was called angele he became accustomed to go there every three days and pass his evenings with her and by this means titurus learned metaphysics algebra and theodicy titurus and angele began to practice together successfully various accomplishments and angele showing particular taste for music they hired a grand piano upon which angele played the little tunes which between times he composed for her titurus said to angele so many occupations will kill me i am at the end of my tether i feel that i am getting used up these consolidated interests intensify my scruples and as my scruples grow greater i grow less what is to be done shall we go away said angele to him i cannot go i have my oak suppose you were to leave it said angele leave my oak you don't mean it is it not large enough now to grow alone but i am attached to it become unattached replied angele and a little while after having realized strongly that after all occupations responsibilities and other scruples could hold him no more than the oak titurus smiled and went off taking with him the cash-box and angele and towards the end of the day walked with her down the boulevard which leads from the madeleine to the opera three that evening the boulevard had a strange look one felt that something unusually grave was going to happen an enormous crowd serious and anxious overflowed the pavement spreading onto the road which the paris police placed at intervals with great trouble kept free before the restaurants the terraces disproportionately enlarged by the placing of chairs and tables made the obstruction more complete and rendered circulation impossible now and again an onlooker impatiently stood upon his chair for an instant the time that one could beg him to get down evidently all were waiting one felt without doubt that between the two pavements upon the protected route something was going to pass having found a table with great difficulty and paid a large price for it angele and titurus installed themselves in front of two glasses of beer and asked the waiter what are they all waiting for where does your lordship come from said the waiter does not your lordship know that every one is waiting to see melibius he will pass by between five and six and there listen i believe one can already hear his flute from the depths of the boulevard the frail notes of a pipe were heard the crowd thrilled with still greater attention the sound increased came nearer grew louder and louder oh how it moves me said angele the setting sun soon threw its rays from one end of the boulevard to the other and as if issuing from the splendor of the setting sun melibius was at last seen advancing preceded by the simple sound of his flute at first nothing could be clearly distinguished but his figure but when he drew nearer oh how charming he is said angele in the meantime melibius as he arrived opposite titurus ceased to play his flute stopped suddenly saw angele and everyone realized that he was naked oh said angele leaning upon titurus how beautiful he is what strong thighs he has his playing is adorable titurus felt a little uncomfortable ask him where he is going said angele where are you going questioned titurus melibius replied Eo romam. what does he say asked angele titurus you would not understand my dear but you can explain it to me said angele romam insisted melibius urbem quam dicunt romam angele oh it sounds delicious what does it mean titurus but my dear angele i assure you it is not so delightful as it sounds it means quite simply that he is going to rome rome said angele dreamily oh i should love so much to see rome melibius resuming his flute once more began to play his primeval melody and at the sound angele in a passion of excitement raised herself stood up drew near and as melibius's arm was bent to her hand she took it and thus the two together went on their way along the boulevard further further they went gradually vanished from sight and disappeared into the finality of the twilit dusk the crowd now unbridled in its agitation became more and more tumultuous on all sides one heard the questions what did he say what did he do who was that woman and when a few minutes later the evening papers appeared a furious curiosity swept over them like a cyclone and it was suddenly divulged that the woman was angele 
and that this melibius was a naked person who was going to italy then all their curiosity having died down the crowd streamed off like water flowing away and the main boulevards were deserted and Titurus found himself alone completely surrounded by the swamp let us grant that i have said nothing an irrepressible laughter shook the audience for several seconds gentlemen i am happy that my story has amused you said prometheus laughing also since the death of damocles i have found the secret of laughter for the present i have finished gentlemen let the dead bury the dead and let us go quickly to lunch he took the waiter by one arm and cockley's by the other they all left the cemetery after passing the gates the rest of the assembly dispersed pardon me said cockley's your story was charming and you made us laugh but i do not quite understand the connection if there had been more you would not have laughed so much said prometheus do not look for too much meaning in all this i wanted above all to distract you and i am happy to have done so surely i owed you that i wearied you so the other day they found themselves on the boulevards where are we going said the waiter to your restaurant if you do not mind in the memory of our first meeting you are passing it said the waiter i do not recognize it it is all new now oh i forgot i forgot that my eagle don't trouble he will never do it again is it true said cockley's what you say what that you have killed him and that we are going to eat him do you doubt it said prometheus have you looked at me when he was alive did i dare to laugh was i not horribly thin certainly he fed on me long enough i think now that it is my turn a table sit down sit down gentlemen waiter do not serve us as a last remembrance take the place of damocles the meal was more joyful than it is possible to say the eagle was found to be delicious and at dessert they all drank his health has he then been useless asked one do not say that cockley's his flesh has nourished us when i questioned him he answered nothing but i eat him without bearing him a grudge and if he had made me suffer less he would have been less fat less fat he would have been less delectable of his past beauty what is there left i have kept all his feathers it is with one of them that i write this little book may you rare friend not find it too foolish epilogue to endeavour to make the reader believe that if this book is such as it is it is not the fault of the author one does not write the books one wants to journal de goncourt the history of leader made such a great stir and covered tindarus with so much glory that minos was not much disturbed to hear pacifii say to him it can't be helped i do not like men but later it is very provoking and it has not been easy i trusted that a god had hidden there if zeus had done his share i should have produced a dioscurus thanks to this animal i have only given birth to a calf end of section three end of prometheus ill bound by andre gide translated by lillian rothermere